This is a podcast from the Business Times. Rolling over your T-bills that has served investors very well over the last two years. Uh, it's coming to an end. So I, we like to say that it's uh, no longer a good time to T-bill and chill, if I could say so. In a normal rate cutting cycle, you would see consumer staples, healthcare, utilities doing a lot better than some of the other sectors of the economy. But that is not the case. Um, it's always good to hold because you never know what the intended or unintended effects are of the rate cut. And with the elections coming up, gold is generally a good thing to hold, a good hedge. As Federal Reserve officials returned to the rostrum late last week, there didn't seem to be more information on what will happen and how it will affect our investments in money. There will be more speeches and data coming out on the 30th of September, so I guess we'll just work with what we've got. Welcome to Money Hacks, a podcast series by The Business Times, where we explore useful financial tips to help you on your money managing and wealth growing journey. I'm Howie Lim. And if you have feedback or an idea for a podcast episode, do get in touch, btpodcasts at sph.com.sg. Helping us out today, Charu Chanana, Head of FX Strategy and Global Market Strategist at Saxo Bank, Daphne Tan, Director of Business Development, CMC Markets, Singapore, and Daryl Ho, Senior Investment Strategist, Chief Investment Office at DBS Bank. And to the matter at hand. In the middle of the month, the U.S. Federal Reserve, the central bank of the world's largest economy, announced a much-anticipated cut in its benchmark interest rate by an arguably surprising number. Or was it? Here's Daphne Tan from CMC Markets, Singapore. I don't think it was unexpected. I think it was expected due to two reasons. So the first reason leads to the second. The first would be there was four data points that came out and it was reassuring both inflation and labour data. So that kind of gave market participants confidence in increasing the expectation for a larger cut. So in terms of inflation data, both the core PCE and the core CPI year on year, they both remain constant. Core PCE year on year being at 2.6% and core CPI year on year being at 3.2%. After that, you had data releases. So the unemployment rate, and uh, referring to that, the Federal Reserve did say that they do not want to see the labour market cooling any further, in which case the unemployment rate, there was a slight decrease from 4.3% to 4.2%. And there was also an increase in jobs added to the market for non-farm payrolls. So that would be your reassuring data. And then we saw that the probability of a larger rate cut was increasing. So on the day of FOMC, it's Itself, uh, it was actually a 52% probability of a 50 basis points cut. Generally, that means that there was already an expectation and that it was already priced into asset prices. And the Federal Reserve tends to do what the expectation is. I mean, it was certainly not the base case in the markets. There was some expectation. I mean, if you look at the market pricing, um, there were about 60% odds that we could get this 50 basis points cut. But most of the market was leaning towards uh, really expecting a 25 basis points cut. Looking back in that week of the rate cut, if you look at the market trends, you would see that the short end yields, the two year bond yields in the treasury, actually did not move quite as much. They were, in fact, a little bit higher to end the week. The other way, uh, you know, that the market had really priced in a move like that. Otherwise, the yields should have certainly ended the week lower. I would say it wasn't the base case. And if you look at the vote split as well, I mean, it was the first time since 2005 that one of the Fed governors actually voted against the decision. She voted to cut rates only by 25 basis points. So that dissent coming through in the Fed votes also kind of says, yes, this could not have been the base case for the markets. That's Charu Chanana from Saxo. Daryl Ho from DBS feels it could have gone either way, given the markets were generally undecided before the decision actually took place. And it was US labour market considerations which tipped the scales. So right before the actual decision, I think the market was actually pricing in a coin flip probability between 25 and 50 basis points. Because I think there were good arguments in both camps. The markets got a 50 basis point cut, which I guess half the market participants were pleased with. So for the 50 basis point cut rationale, I think the Fed was seeing that the labour markets were softening quite quickly. right? So unemployment did rise from a low of around 3.6% to, to 42 
So with the ascension of that unemployment rate, I think they were a bit cautious. And there were reasons to make the cut a bit more sizable than, I guess, the traditional 25 basis point move that the Fed normally takes. You know, inflation has been coming down, but uh, it is not yet very close to where the 2% target is traditionally. As well as the job markets, even at 4.2% unemployment, that is still a rather robust job market, despite the fact that unemployment rate has been rising. It was a 50-50 and the Fed finally decided that the 50 basis point cut was suitable, then finally confirming that the labor market was the priority in their considerations. Wow. If analysts and market players are using a coin flip to figure this out, what chance do we retail investors have to know what to do? One thing that's been coming out is it's definitely not a good idea to be overweight in cash as we've been for the last few years. With our cash sitting pretty and growing in high-yield savings accounts. Okay, breathe. Breathe. Where we see the best opportunities is really in fixed income. And that's why we have an overweight in the asset class. When interest rates come down, you want instruments that secure higher rates for a longer term. Right? And that's precisely what bonds give to you. The fact that there are promised payments of coupon. And so the idea that you can secure these yields for a longer term with in view the idea that the, the interest rate environment is coming down is very attractive. They're going to get today's level of high coupons for a longer term. The additional benefit is really in a declining interest rate environment, there is a potential for capital gains for fixed income instruments as well. For equities, it's also just as interesting, right? If the soft lending does materialize as the Fed is very eager to manifest, what you can look forward to is earnings growth. In a modest growth environment, earnings projections would still be quite healthy. And so you can already see, right, there's a broadening projection of higher earnings over the next year in 2025 for a broad swath of sectors over in the equity space. Not only that, I guess, I guess if the interest rate environment does come down, there could be valuation expansion as well. So equities look like a very interesting space to be in as well if the soft lending narrative continues to play out. What asset class would do the worst? And it's quite obvious to us that it's cash, right? Because if the Fed is cutting rates, you know, the entire practice of rolling over your deposits, rolling over your T-bills that has served investors very well over the last two years uh, is coming to an end. So I, we like to say that it's uh, no longer a good time to T-bill and chill, if I could say so. Funny man Daryl Ho from DBS there. More about where we can put our money now that the Fed has cut its interest rate with Daryl Charuchalana from Saxo and Daphne Tan from CMC Markets Singapore in a moment. Yeah, here's hoping... If you've been a fan of the podcast Mark to Market, Wealth BT and Property BT, they are moving to a new listing, BT Correspondence. Look for episodes every Tuesday from October. All the insights and analysis and market trends, property, wealth, and soon mobility too. Powered by the Business Times journalism of Genevieve Kwa, Leslie Yi, Ben Paul, and Darren Wong. Because great reads should be heard. The BT Correspondence Channel. Find BT Correspondence wherever you listen to podcasts. And now, back to Money Hacks from the Business Times. What will happen to our investments now that the Fed has cut its rate? Should we rejig our portfolios and what should we be looking into? And hey, if you have feedback on an episode idea, please get in touch. BT Podcasts at sph.com.sg. Helping us answer our questions today are Charu Chanana from Saxo, Daryl Ho from DBS, and Daphne Tan from CMC Markets Singapore. Yeah, so generally the one that stands out the most would be gold. So in terms of gold, lower interest rates will lower the opportunity cost for the metal. And it tends to be the most precious metal in that sense. It is also a safe haven asset. Um, it's always good to hold because you never know what the intended or unintended effects are of the rate cut. And with the elections coming up, gold is generally a good thing to hold, a good hedge, essentially. Investors might want to consider reducing exposure to financials like banks because lower interest rates tend to erode uh, their net interest margin. So basically the difference that they make between the borrowing cost and the lending cost. They tend to do well in rate hike environments, um, but not rate cut environments. Defensive historically tend to do well immediately. So that would be like your utilities, consumer staples and healthcare. And after that, about six months later, medium term, consumer discretionary could tend to do well because when interest rates fall, then it becomes more affordable to spend on unnecessities. 
Charu from Saxo is not convinced defensive is the way to go, though. Um, so far, it seems like an environment that has been extremely focused on the fact that we are able to achieve that soft landing. So, in fact, the defensive part of the economy, of the markets, have not done as well, I would say. In a normal rate-cutting cycle, you would see consumer staples, healthcare, utilities doing a lot better than some of the other sectors of the economy. But that is not the case. So, the defensives did outperform a little bit in the run-up to, but after that... The defensives have been a little bit on the back foot because it's been a risk on environment. Oh boy, then what? You know, something like small caps doing better than large caps, something like emerging markets, particularly in Asia, doing better than Western markets, commodities, which are such a demand driven sector of the markets, uh, that also doing relatively better. So we've seen some good performances across asset classes, particularly with risk assets outperforming. And it is a very positive environment for REITs. Interest rates are coming down and the economy is holding up. But if the second side of the equation changes, that, you know, the economy does not do as well or there are further signs of weakness, then the occupancy rates of REITs will come into question and that will impact the performance of REITs as well. So, of course, they're a high dividend yielding asset and it kind of adds an interesting aspect to your portfolios. Certainly, by all means, we should look at that. But we have to also stay on alert for these economic trends uh, because there is likely going to be a lot of volatility in the markets in the coming months. Watching this down, gold, wheat, small cap, emerging market. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> so we said earlier that more data will be coming out 30th of September, along with more speeches. What could be gleaned from say, reading between the lines, or is there a way to guess where the Fed might head next? Why should we care, you say? Well, haven't you heard that saying from the Prussian diplomat? When the US sneezes, the world catches a cold. Here's Daryl Ho from DBS. Not just the Fed chair, there are a lot of committee members that would be having various meetings across the next couple of weeks. So the narrative that comes out from them would also be important. They are positioning themselves with some flexibility. They have uh, conducted a jumbo cut, but again, the path is also important. So I think what's clear to us is that the interest rate environment is coming down. That is not the debate. The debate is really around the speed. A lot more clarity would come around the committee members in their own narratives, how fast they expect the rate environment to come down. And I think they'll be paying very close attention to the labor markets again, since we have kind of established that that is the focus today, much more so than inflationary pressures. Okay, that's one for wait and see. Charu, Daphne? Uh, there's a lot of data to focus on to really analyze and understand where the Fed goes from here. There's been clear lack of forward guidance from the Fed. So we don't know what their next action could look like. It could very well be a hold. It could be a cut. It could be a 50 basis point cut. The market remains very volatile, trying to guess what the next move could be. And so we have to be prepared for that kind of volatility as well. Yes, wait and see, but you can start like rebalancing your portfolio slowly. So for example, increasing your like a uh, percentage in let's say safer haven assets like gold and maybe having some defensive stocks and then the rest you can wait and see because the effects tend to be delayed. I mean, effects of the rate cut cycle and there could be shorter term trends because every cycle is different. So once the shorter term trends start to show themselves, in which case investors can further rebalance their portfolios and go into those and take on some riskier stocks. Um, there's no real world impact just yet, likely because it just takes time. I would say maybe three to six months to surface in the real world. And also in terms of economic kind of effects, such as like whether or not there's going to be a recession, uh, that's going to take some time to see. Wait and see it shall be. In the meantime, get in touch if you have feedback or an episode idea. BT Podcasts at sph.com.sg. Thanks to Daphne Tan from CMC Markets Singapore, Charu Chanana from Saxo, and Daryl Ho from DBS. I'm Howie Lim, and this has been Money Hacks from the Business Times. This is a podcast by the Business Times. Find more BT podcasts at businesstimes.com.sg slash podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is meant to provide general information only. SPH Media accepts no liability for loss arising from any reliance on the podcast or use of third parties' products and services. 
Please consult professional advisors for independent advice.